Hi everyone, and welcome to the Genelec Immersive Audio video series. My name is Eric, and in the following episodes we're going to cover everything around Immersive Audio and how to get started. In this first episode, we're going to talk about the most popular Immersive Audio formats and where you actually find them. Let's dive in. Before we start this, we have to ask ourselves what actually is Immersive Audio and how is it defined? So Immersive Audio is an acronym for 3D audio or spatial audio. So there are many words occurring these days around there. But basically they all have a couple of things in common. First of all, we're introducing a third dimension of sound reproduction. This can be done by multiple ceiling speakers or multiple layers of surround channels in your um, mix room or in the cinema actually where it originally comes from. So this is a very critical question. The next thing is we have to discuss two basic concepts, how immersive audio is done. And this is unique to immersive audio. It's object-based audio versus channel-based audio. And this question I'm going to put up a little later and we're going to cover this a little later in the presentation, but that's one very important immersive audio specific question. And then the question is where can you actually experience immersive audio? So of course its origin, it comes from cinemas because it was a follow-up for multiple surround formats. Then it made its way into home cinemas. Um, and then at the end of the day, smart speakers, sound bars and headphones. So all these different use cases can be used uh, to experience immersive audio content these days. Let's cover a little bit the most popular immersive audio formats, knowing that there are much more out there. Dolby Atmos has been introduced in 2012. As I already said, it comes from cinema. So it was a, a follow-up format to the 7.1 Dolby Surround format by adding a height channel or a ceiling channel with speakers in the ceiling. It can be considered to be a hybrid format because it uses channels and objects, basically. And um, Dolby Atmos can be found very widely in the industry, in cinemas. Home cinema is a very popular field for Dolby Atmos, uh, not only kind of uh, the movies that come from cinema into home cinema, but also Netflix is, for instance, a content provider that is heavily uh, relying on Dolby Atmos or Apple TV. Um, all the originals are done in Dolby Atmos. We find Dolby Atmos also in broadcast. Uh, a couple of interesting um, examples are, for instance, here in Europe, uh, the Eurovision Song Contest, which is uh, broadcasted in Dolby Atmos. And now since roughly two and a half years, Dolby Atmos can be heavily found in the music industry. With the latest announcement of Apple Music, it actually made a big buzz in the music industry. The next big format is Oro 3D, which has been shown to public in 2010. And it's a channel-based format with an object-based extension called Oro Max. From a speaker configuration point of view, it exists in multiple different layouts. The most popular setups are actually 9.1, 11.1 and 13.1, with up to three layers of speakers around the audience. Oro 3D is very well received in cinemas, in home cinemas, you can find it in broadcast, gaming, automotive but also in the music creation world, as it also offers high sample rates of up to 96 kHz. And the format also allows the traditional mastering process. A lot of people actually use Oro 3D to capture um, real sound, for instance, in a nice sounding orchestra hall or in a church or something like this, because there are actually um, microphone setups that can accommodate Oro 3D. MPEG-H is a development by the Fraunhofer Institute and is uh, mainly used in broadcast. It's a, a channel-based or object-based format, it's very flexible, and um, is also the base format for the Sony 360 Reality Audio format that has been introduced by Sony a couple of years ago. And uh, the Sony 360 Reality Audio format is designed to be played back on smart speakers and headphones and is mainly targeted to the music industry and the music production environment. Let's have a little closer look on how Dolby Atmos theatrical setups actually lay out in a cinema. Um, first of all, the Dolby Atmos soundtrack um, contains of up to 128 inputs. Those 128 inputs 
are always a 10 channel bed, which is a 7.1.2 fixed layout, a channel based layout. And then we have the choice of using up to 118 objects. From the speaker point of view, it is a flexible speaker configuration and it's a scalable system. That means up to 64 speakers can be used depending on the size of the room. And as you can see on the picture on the left hand side, all the red speakers have been there all the time. So those are the speakers that date back to the original 5.1 time. So mid 90s it came out. And all the blue speakers that you can see in this picture are actually added speakers for the Dolby Atmos format. First of all, we have more speakers on the side surrounds in order to make a, a, a complete circle of speakers from the stage into the audience. Uh, very interesting is every speaker can be addressed individually. So when you create a soundtrack, you can decide that a little sound, no matter what sound you use, even if it's a, a, little, a little bird or something, can be placed freely on each individual speaker. Whereas back in the 5.1 times, when you were panning sounds into the surround, it always was played on an array of speakers. And another interesting topic is every speaker is now calibrated with full frequency range, so full range, and at 85 dB SPL. That means every surround speaker offers the same performance than the front speakers behind the screen. And this gives a lot of uh, creative possibilities to design your soundtrack. Dolby Atmos Home Cinema or Home Entertainment um, is basically a stripped down version of the theatrical version. Um, the creation tools are actually the same. So it doesn't matter if I'm creating a soundtrack that will end up in a theatrical movie or a soundtrack that will end up in a little piece of music on a streaming service. The creation tools are the same. Home cinema setups can handle up to 22 speakers, which is a lot for a home cinema. And the most common setups are 512, 514, 7.1.4, 914, 916. And uh, interesting is there is no certification needed to actually produce content in your studio. So as long as you have the tools, have a bunch of speakers, you can start working uh, in Dolby Atmos and actually can produce content and deliver it to your end customer or to the distributor. Oro 3D looks a little bit different as the ceiling speakers are mounted in a different manner. Um, as already said, it offers up to three layers of speakers around the audience and um, most popular anywhere between 9.1, 11.1 and 13.1 layouts. It works um, as the following. Oro 3D takes the already existing base layer of a traditional surround format like 5.1 or 7.1 and is adding a four channel or five channel height layer directly above it. So that means above the left speaker, for instance, you have a height left and above the right speaker, you have a height right and so on. And in terms of angling the speakers towards the listening position, so the, the mounting height, it is actually mounted at 30 degrees height, which is not as high as Dolby Atmos. And um, in the optional Voice of God layer, this is a, um, a, a sound source that is mounted directly above the audience. This is actually acting as the third layer. Let's have a look at MPEG-H. MPEG-H is a channel-based and object-based format. So either or, or in any kind of combination. As we already mentioned, it is part of a broadcast standard of the ATSC 3.0. And what's interesting here is that there are interactive features available for end users, for example, at the dialogue level. So if somebody at home is not understanding the dialogue correctly, if an MPEG-H soundtrack is provided, we can dial in the volume of the dialogue track, for instance. Or if you think about a sport um, production, like a football game or a tennis game or something, you can think of having multiple commentators and you can choose which one you want to listen to. So this is very interesting features of MPEG-H. Um, the speaker layout is usually 7.1.4 or 5.14 uh, and those are mainly determined by the ITU certification and ITU circle. So the placement of the speakers and the usage of the speakers follows uh, the same principles also Dolby is following in this case. And as we already mentioned, uh, the MPEG-H is also used as a base format for the Sony 360 RA format. Now, I was giving you a lot of different numbers. Now, what are these numbers actually standing for? So when we look at Adobe Atmos 
speaker layout or an MPEG-H speaker layout, uh, and we talk about a 714 layout, that means actually that we have seven speakers at ear height mounted around us in a specific manner. The dot one is considered to be the subwoofer, and the dot one is considered to be the subwoofer channel, not necessarily the speaker. You can actually have multiple subwoofers fed by the same channel. And then we have four ceiling speakers in this particular example. When we talk about Oro 3D, for instance, the biggest Oro 3D setup is a 13.1, which is quite similar to a 714, a little bit bigger. So we have seven speakers on the lower level. We have five speakers on this 30 degree height layer. And then we have the voice of God and the dot one is the subwoofer channel, basically. So this is where these numbers are actually coming from. Now, let's talk about channel-based and object-based audio. What's actually the difference? When we talk about channel-based audio, we have a little example here. So on the left-hand side, we have a little car sound, which is just a little car driving around. And now you can think of, in a channel-based workflow, this car sound shall be moved around the audience in a 5.1 speaker setup. So first of all, we can pan the car to the left channel with our joystick or with our panning tool in our uh, audio application. Then we can pan it to the center and we can pan it to the right channel. Now, when we want to move that car around us and we pan it into the right surround, a lot of speakers in a cinema are actually playing back this particular sound at the same time. So an array of speakers is reproducing this sound at the same time. And then from there, we can pan it into the left surround. So what's the difference now to an object-based audio workflow? And that's simply put, we have the same car sound and we're adding X, Y, Z coordinates, so metadata. And these two elements are being fed into a renderer unit. In this particular case, it's a Dolby Atmos renderer. So that means now that this little car can travel around the listener by being reproduced on each individual speaker. That means we're adding a lot of precision to the surrounds. And what's very important to know is that this is now scalable. If you have more speakers in the surround, the car will travel on more speakers around you. If you have less speakers, this car has been reproduced on less speakers. So fully scalable. And that's the biggest difference of object-based versus channel-based audio. In broadcast applications, when object-based workflows are used, it's not mainly for panning stuff. It's more about having alternative content, such a second narrator, or a, a special dialogue track or something, or for um, yeah, special purpose elements. Okay, moving along to the end of the food chain, let's say we have created Adobe Atmos soundtrack. How does it actually end up in our living room or where we wanna have it on the Blu-ray or on streaming? So first of all, we have a final mix. And the final mix is being recorded into an Atmos Home Master file. So that is basically just one file that contains our whole mix, including the metadata, including all the audio elements. And now, depending on which format and which reproduction system and which streaming service has actually been used, this particular software, the media encoder, is encoding this Atmos master file in, into multiple different codecs. So the Dolby True HD codec, for instance, is used for Blu-ray because it's a lossless encode and uh, it would be too big in terms of bandwidth for streaming. So that's why it's a little bit a higher, um, higher graded encoder that's been used for Blu-ray. The Dolby Digital Plus codec, that's the one we're using today or that is being used today for everything that goes into streaming. So when you watch a Netflix series or an Apple series or listen to a piece of music either on Tidal or on uh, Apple Music, it is Dolby Digital Plus encoded in one flavor or another. But still, the Adobe Atmos Home Master file is also able to uh, produce dedicated downmixes for special purpose uh, deliverables, such as a, a stereo TV mix or a 5.1 Blu-ray mix or something like this. So these are called the re-renders and can be exported right, of the, right out of the master file. But that's basically the way 
how you mix travels from your final recording step up to your end user. What production tools are there available for the different formats? That's a pretty uh, simplified drawing now. So for Dolby Atmos, whoever's interested in creating Dolby Atmos um, content in the home environment, I'm not talking about theatrical, but the tools are more or less the same, but the renderer is slightly different. So in this particular case, we are referencing the production suite, which is the renderer software. And then there is a big amount of uh, audio workstations that is capable of producing Dolby Atmos native um, metadata. Um, Pro Tools being one of the mostly used DAWs, um, Nuendo has implemented Dolby Atmos natively into their uh, environment. Uh, Fairlight, part of the Blackmagic Resolve bundle. Uh, Logic Pro, for instance, is also using um, dedicated um, and native Dolby Atmos metadata and Pyramix. So those are the tools who are using Dolby Atmos metadata natively in the software. All the other applications can also create Dolby Atmos content, such as Reaper or uh, Ableton Live or uh, Cubase or Fruity Loops or Studio One, you name them, uh, by using the Dolby Atmos Music Panner plugin, which is a free of charge plugin that comes with the production suite that allows you to create Dolby Atmos content right out of the software. The Oro 3D production tools look slightly different. So first of all, you still have a Panner plugin. That's exactly, that follows the same principle. And everything that is created with the Panner plugin is been uh, recorded or sent into an Oro Mix engine. And this engine knows how many speakers you have installed and where they are mounted, and is then outputting dedicated mixes for the height and top layer and for the lower layer. And uh, the good thing is it actually uses your same I.O. interface that you're using for Pro Tools anyways, for instance. There's no need of going into a separate software and then hitting the speakers. So it's all taken care of right in the Pro Tools session. And a very interesting tool is the Oromatic Pro 3D, which is an upmix tool that can create from stereo up to 11.1, 13.1 um, content. With MPEG-H, it looks pretty similar than Dolby Atmos because it also contains a rendering unit and a panning unit. Uh, for instance, you can use the Fraunhofer Authoring Plugin Suite, which is available uh, right out of way uh, from Fraunhofer. But then uh, the new audio technology company has a tool that is called Spatial Audio Designer, and they also have a MPEG-H output, basically. So whatever you create in the Spatial Audio Designer can be encoded into an MPEG-H uh, mix. Mentioning Logic, the latest addition to the family uh, offers an integrated rendering solution for Dolby Atmos in this particular case and um, is a very simplified and streamlined workflow targeted to the music production community. Very interesting tool set and it can handle up to 7.1.4 in terms of outputs or speaker outputs and of course the binaural headphone feed. All right, so those were kind of the basics in the different uh, immersive audio formats. I hope you found this interesting. If you have any more questions around immersive audio or any particular questions also coming later about uh, speaker setups and the technical installation in your room, uh, please watch this space. There are multiple episodes uh, covering these formats. If you need more information, you're always welcome to navigate to genelec.com and search for the Immersive Hub or write us an email at immersive.helpdesk at genelec.com and we're always more than happy to help you here. Thank you very much, bye-bye uh, and take care.